Hey guys, and welcome to Anchor to Truth. Tonight we are diving into chapter 11 of the Book of Jubilees. So let's get started. All right, guys, let's, uh, we're going to start in chapter 11. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to be in chapter 11. And uh, here we go. It says in verse 1, it says, In the 35th Jubilee, in the third week, in the first year thereof, where you took to himself a wife, and her name was Ora, the daughter of Ur, the son of Kesed, and she bare him a son, and he called his name Sarah. In the seventh year of this week, in this jubilee, and the sons of Noah began to war on each other, to take captive and to slay each other, and to shed the blood of men on the earth, and to eat blood, and to build strong cities and walls and towers, and individuals began to exalt themselves above the nation, and to find, found the beginnings of kingdoms, and to go to war, people against people, and nations against nation, and city against city, and all began to do evil, and to acquire arms, and to teach their sons war, and they began to capture cities and to sell male and female slaves. And Ur, the son of Kesed, built the city of Ara of the Chaldees, and called its name after its own name and the name of his father. And they made for themselves molten images, and they worshipped worship each the idol, the molten image, which they had made for themselves. And they began to make graven images and unclean simulacra, and malignant spirits assisted and seduced them into committing transgression and uncleanliness. And the prince Mastema exerted himself to do all this, and he sent forth other spirits, those which were put under his hand, to do all manner of wrong and sin and all manner of transgression, to corrupt and destroy, to shed blood upon the earth. For this reason he called the name of Sarah, Sarug, for everyone turned to do all manner of sin and transgression. Yeah, so really early on here in uh, verse 2, we see that the sons of Noah... Um, I, I like that it gives us a, a definite people group. A you know we're still talking about Noah, his sons, his post flood actions, and you know we're not far after flood, and we're starting to see a lot of the sin creeping back into the world. You know these mm -hmm. eight people that got on the boat were supposedly blameless and holy. You know they were the only people on the earth that were worthy to be saved um, via the ark, and now you know we're one, two generations down the line. And we're starting to see sin creep back in. So I think one of the things that's interesting is that we have to be, you know, careful and on guard ourselves of even when we're in the best place that we can be and we're, you know, feeling mm -hmm. like we're the closest to the Father possible, that sin is always there, ready to creep in. And um, you see this with the sons, how they started to uh, slay each other and to shed blood and even go as far as to eat the blood. So these, these would have been things that were very obvious, right? These are Ten Commandment things. Do not murder. You know, they, they're, they're mm -hmm. uh, slaying each other. They're eating blood. One of the commands about uncleanliness, um, they're very quickly turning back to the ways of the world. Well, what's what's interesting, though, is it's not the ways of the world. They are now creating the ways of the world. This isn't something that they had to drive all the way to some foreign country to figure out. They are the ones who are starting this practice back up that should mm -hmm. have been gone and done away with. So I thought that was very interesting to put those details in there and for us to see um, that timeline and that time frame of how that occurred. Yeah, and uh, the interesting thing with that too, guys, is we see that uh, Satan is going full out on creation. He is going full out assault. Um, you know, if, uh, when we were in chapter 10, the verse, first part of chapter 10, uh, just as a reminder, that's where Noah was praying to Abba, and he was like, hey, he, Noah already knew that the, the evil spirit, the unclean spirits, they were already coming in, they were already affecting men, they were already uh, bringing about change. Uh, his sons were starting to sin. And we and when we read that, you know, the the part of that is we're only dealing with ten percent here, mm -hmm. because um, as Noah prayed to Abba, he's like, "Hey, take them all out. They're they're corrupting. They're doing the, the wrong thing." And then we see Mastema, aka the adversary, aka Satan, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him, mm -hmm. he shows up and says, "Hey, let me hold on to ten percent." And with that ten percent, <laughs> you know, over here in verse five that he's highlighting. And then it says, and he sent forth other spirits. And it says, those which are put under his hand and to do all manner of wrong and sin and all manner of transgression to corrupt and destroy and to shed blood, right? As upon the earth. So we're seeing that Mastema, Satan himself, it says he sent, that he's, he's in there exerting himself into this whole thing. And not only that, but he's taking that 10% that was given to him by Abba 
and we see this playing out right now. It's like you're talking about Jonathan, and it's it's sad to see that we just went from a few chapters earlier. Everyone's getting their portion. They're getting their land. Hey, go do your thing where you're at. You go do your thing where you're at. And for some reason, the brothers decided, you know what? I don't like any of you, and I'm going. And then we're all going to fight each other, <laughs> and do and and absolutely do the absolute opposite of what the Torah says for us to do. Yeah, I think too. Like um, as we were, you know, verse two is super long, but in the middle there, it talks about building strong cities and walls and towers, and individuals began to exalt themselves above the nations, and they started to make kingdoms and all that. You know, and and it. It, all that's written in a very, um, as the way I'm reading, is a negative connotation, which in our world today, we think, oh, you had a big kingdom? Well, that must mean you're good. You're successful. You've won the game. You've conquered all. But right. when we when we read Torah, when we read Scripture, it's very much the opposite. It's about community. It's about bringing in the sojourner. It's about treating everybody equally and, you know, being the salt and the light into the world and not hiding the light and not, you know, uh, hoarding up all of your treasures and hoarding up all your food. It's about taking care of the poor and the widows and the needy. So you can see even in that, that their desire to hey, give me, give me, give me, this is all mine. Here's my wall. Don't come in. Don't, don't ask any questions. And I'm going to take your stuff versus working hard for it myself. Um, it's just, it's just interesting to see that, that how that's played out all throughout history. We look at medieval times. We look at, you know, literally all of history. It's all about land grab, money grab, and, um, how can we get the most out of the world and how do, how do we make ourselves better than you? The, the, the rich are better than the poor. There's the Kings subjugate the people. It's, you know, it's a constant trend throughout the world and nothing in scripture tells us that we should do or act that way. Right. And you know, the other thing too, guys, that I'm looking at um, just thoughts that are coming to my brain at this moment is that we're getting ready to go into the story of Abraham here in chapter at the, at the, um, the second half of chapter 11, and so we see with Abraham, it makes me wonder if this is why God, through Abraham, was going to bring about this seed that was going to bring healing to the nations eventually, because the nations are at war, the nations are destroying themselves, the nations are setting up strongholds, the nations are setting up, uh, they're making molten images, you know, in verse 4 there it says, and they made for themselves molten images, and they worship each the idol and molten image which they had uh, made for themselves. And so you see all this taking place because Israel, you know, when we get all the way through the patriarchs and we get to Israel, a.k.a. Jacob, and we see that their purpose, especially when they came out of Mitzrayim, was they were supposed to be a light set up on the hill for who? All the nations. nations. Yeah. And so God's like, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a set apart people because everything's so corrupt, everything's so sideways that I'm going to have a set apart people that are going to be the light into the nation so that when the nations look and say, why are you so blessed? Why are you this? Why blah, 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 blah. You know, all the things, why is your land growing the best crops? You know, why do you have the cleanest water and the best streams and you know, all these things that people would all, but all of this would be to turn people's hearts back to the father. Yep. And unfortunately we see just right, right after they get out of Egypt and Mount Sinai, when Moses goes up, what do they do? They make a molded image. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, kind of messes up the plans a little bit. But, you know, God's will will be done, and he will be glorified when it's all said and done. Amen. So what else I saw was, like, Joe, you just brought up, which is a really good point, talking about the molten images and the idols that they made. So these weren't just things that showed up out of the blue. They didn't find these when they dug in the ground. They didn't, um, you know, magically <laughs> they didn't magi figure they didn't out. They magically come out of the fire. <laughs> exactly, right, yeah. Yeah. You know, they, they would have had to – had those thoughts and those uh, desires to make something of worship, to decide mm -hmm. that the father commanded worship and we're going to go outside of that. And I think what was interesting, you brought up Abraham and I correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't his father an idol maker? Yes. We were going to so read he, about that here. Yeah. He would yeah. have been exactly in, you know, in this scenario where you can see God, like his remnant we talked about before, he's always pulling somebody out. He's always pulling mm -hmm. a group out. Even in the midst of like the worst thing, you know, literally what the first commandments that God gave was, you know, I'm the Lord, your God and have no other God before me. And then they're like, we're going to have another God before you, you know, and it's like, but we just I just told I you mean, not to do isn't that. It's amazing that everyone's doing the exact opposite. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, the exact. He says, don't drink blood. What do the sons do? Hey, you, let's drink blood. <laughs> <laughs> don't make any graven images. Hey, let's make a graven image. You know, exactly. Like, 
But it's, it's, isn't that human nature, though, you know, like to twist or to be wicked or to go against, you know, once we have a rule, then we, now we know that there's something that we can do against that. You know, a lot of times we don't even know that we're following rules that, that haven't been laid out for us. But as soon as it's laid out for us, we instantly want to go the opposite of that. And right. I thought it was funny that it, the way it said the idols and the images, those popped up. And then what's the next verse? And Prince Mastima exerted himself. It was like, oh, yeah. They they gave themselves over with all the war and the you know they were making themselves idols they were you know trying to make themselves high and mighty with their castles and their walls and all this stuff then they built their idols and then now what happens Mastima exerted himself right the Satan ex exerted himself you you get that very quick action of your choice and your actions lead to these oppressions uh, and all this negativity of demons and devils and all that stuff. It's, it's their actions that started it all. It kicked it off. It didn't, they, he didn't just show up out of the blue and was like, Oh, surprise. Here's some new stuff. You didn't know. It was like, you already were putting yourself first and even more so other things before God. So he's like, if you're going to do that, why not put me before God? Why, why not? That's where I want to be anyway. That's what I fell out of heaven for. Right. And you see that play out exactly perfectly. Yep, he definitely got a hold of the pride of men, too, because when they're building these strong cities and these fortified cities and there's this pride there that's taking place. And I believe that Satan, uh, Mastima, is just pumping them full of stuff just in their heads and just, you know, and the sad part is, and they began to teach their sons war. I might be wrong, but I don't think I am. This was never, like you said earlier, Jonathan, this was never in the father's plans for his children to be killing each other and to try to, you know, Let's face it, the three sons got the entire earth. <laughs> they got some land. They got they got enough that I would never see you again if I didn't want to see you. We literally <laughs> could live on the far corners right. of the world and never have to. But for some reason, it's like, no, man, we're going we're gonna to throw down, and I'm going to kill your people, and you're going to kill mine, and I'm going to teach my sons to do the same thing. And it's just, it's very, it breaks my heart, man, to think that, you know, even if it was a few generations after the flood, that man's hearts are now returning to this evil once again. Mm -hmm. Well, man, you guys really hit on a lot of the points that I was uh, really wanting to talk about there. So uh, maybe we can dig in a little bit further. Um, but, but man, y'all were on a roll there. So mm -hmm. let's pull it back <laughs> up for a minute. Going back to verse two, let's look at that real quick. Shed the blood of men on the earth and to eat blood. That seems like that's going hand in hand. So I don't know mm -hmm. what you guys are thinking, but that don't sound like a rare steak they're eating. Sounds uh, like no. shed the blood of men and eat blood, as in consume human blood. Yes. Right? Yeah, we're not talking like, about bulls and goats here with this one. I, I don't think. I agree with you. Yeah, very possible. Just in the context of this, because just, just right above that where it says to take captive and to slay each other. Um, so we know they're slaying each other. They're going to war. They're killing, you know, the sons of Noah are killing each other or not each other, but they're killing each other's family folk. Mm -hmm. And then it says to shed the blood of men on the earth and to eat blood, um, which is, I, I would assume this is meaning in context here that they're actually drinking the blood of men or eating the blood, you know, same difference, but eating the blood of men. Yeah. And I think that these practices are the very same reasons why we see such wickedness going on today with the things mm -hmm. uh, happening with people of influence and the things mm -hmm. that are going on with the uh, human trafficking and all that kind of stuff. It's a it's a sad, sad thing, but I think that this has a lot to do with it. This is my personal opinion. I believe it is completely evil, 100 percent evil. Oh, absolutely. Uh, something else I noticed at the very end of la uh, verse two is, you know, there's some people that will try to make a case for uh, saying that that God was OK with slavery. Right. Whether he promoted it or was just OK with it, he was at least OK with it. And I beg to differ. Now, we can pull lots of things from the regular 66 books, but. In the context of what's being said here in verse 2, we have all these horrible, horrible things that are happening. So it just wouldn't make sense in context for this last statement and to sell male and female slaves. It doesn't make sense for the entire, you know, verse 2 to have all this negative, 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 and then a okay thing at the bottom, <laughs> right? Right. So this is showing it to be a negative thing as well. Yep. Uh, I'm in agreement with you that this is not, that was not the father's will. This is not Torah. This is not um, the way things are supposed to be. 
in the Torah, we see that someone who has become a um, indentured servant to someone who's become technically, they use the word slave there, uh, means that they're giving of a service for something in return. So if they owed a debt mm-hmm. or their family to say they couldn't feed, they, they couldn't feed their family. They would go to this person and say, hey, um, I know that you're wealthy and I'm willing to take myself and be an indentured servant to you so that I can need and not only me, but also my family. And at the very end of that, we see in the story in the Torah that that, that person at the end of his uh, servitude has the uh, ability um, to go back to the master and say, hey, I love it here so much, I don't want to leave. And so it says that the master would put it all through the year and it would be through the post of the door, signifying to everyone that, hey, he's made the decision that he is going to stay. And so, again, the contrast here, it says to sell male and female slaves. That is not part of Jehovah's plan whatsoever. People will kind of sometimes bring this up and say, well, God had, you know, he was all about slavery. No, this is different. These are people that are being taken against their will. Correct. Correct. Awesome. Glad you brought that up. Well, another thing I wanted to bring up was up here in verse four, when it's going through, you know, all the molten images and that sort of stuff, it says, and malignant spirits assisted and seduced them into committing transgression and uncleanness. uh, uncleanness. So these spirits are helping them have success in these evil things, right? Yep. Uh, And seduced them or lured them or made things look attractive, however you want to view that, but made it more intriguing, more interesting, more (laughs) hopeful, more whatever, right? Yeah. Made them want it. Made them want it. So I thought that was um, really interesting. Well, let me ask you this. Um, How do you think that they were doing this? How do you think these unclean spirits were, or do you think these people were being like mediums where they were reaching out to these spirits and the spirits were speaking to them or you know, sometimes I just wonder about that because we did have, I believe it was Noah's, uh, if I, I'm, I may be wrong, but I believe it was Noah's grandson who had found uh, a book or information that was, you know, after the flood, of course, that was giving information, let's say, of the of the fallen ones that should not have fallen back into the hands of man. So it just makes me wonder if, if they were the ones, you know, maybe these malignant spirits were reaching out and they were, I don't know. I just, I'm just kind of curious what you guys think may have been the part in here of those spirits actually helping in, uh, in this assisting in this. Well, as we discussed in previous, uh, previous chapters, you know, we discussed how, how the enemy or adversary, uh, seems to work a little differently nowadays than he did in the past. And in the sense Mm -hmm. of, you know, back then it was, you know, build up an altar to me and and he wanted all the fame and fortune and he wanted all yep. the notoriety and the worship and the praise and all this. And now it's more of a, you know, greatest sin or the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convince the world that he didn't exist. Right. Exactly. So it's, he's he's kind of the the the, the man, behind, never mind the man behind the curtain kind of deal, if you will. And why, right? why, why do you think he wants people not to not to think now of him in that way? What would be the benefit uh, to him? A known enemy is easily <clears throat> a known enemy is easily defeated. What I what I think some of this might be is because people, as we have um, living in the age we are now, if people were to look at this and go, "Well, if there is evil, there must be good," and mm-hmm. so in a roundabout way, it may actually draw people back to Jehovah. If Satan was to show himself like he did back then, today. People will go, wait a minute, um, I didn't believe in anything. I didn't believe in good or evil, but the fact that you're showing up and the fact that you're doing this now convinces me if you're here, then there must be a God. So I think that's yep. why he stays out of the limelight as much. It, he infiltrates the world in different ways through multimedia, social media, all these different things. And But he doesn't come out like here. He's actually participating. He's a part of this. what's going on. Where today is like, no, I'm not here. Nothing to see here, folks. There's no devil in the red suit here. And because people don't recognize evil, because I've heard, you know, um, atheists go, well, I don't believe in good or evil. Well, but if, he, but if evil showed up one day and it was obvious who it was, then people would say, oh, well, maybe there is a God. So that's that's why I think. Some of yeah, and it's and it's too it's too easy to uh, to to check what these spirits have to say today. 
you know, I mean, it's uh, virtually everyone on, on the, on the earth has the, has a cell phone and has access to internet, mm -hmm. you know, and if you have access to internet, um, most parts of the world, you have access to the Bible, right? And the most publicized book in the history of mankind every year since it's been printed or in print has always been the Bible. So, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I think that has, has something to do with it. I think very much so, you know, it's, it would very quickly not serve him well, no. <laughs> I think. So I think that's, I think that's why I, I would agree. You know, back then they didn't have hundreds of billions of printed copies everywhere. Right. right? So, so I think that, I think that has something to do with it. So, yeah, I think they were very obvious then. I think that they, um, they, they moved and spoke in ways that we don't necessarily see that as common practice today, maybe mm -hmm. in some, um, maybe in some aspects, but for the most part, I would say it's not uh, not anything like that nowadays. Hey guys, if you're enjoying the study so far and you would like to continue studying along with us, be sure to hit that subscribe button, tag that notification bell. So you'll be notified next time we post a video. Yeah. I think, uh, two key words that they use there in verse four was, assisted and seduced mm -hmm. you know there's no mention of taken over controlled um, correct possession uh, possession yeah no, nothing yeah. like that it's hey we're gonna throw it out there we're gonna make it look really good it's still your choice you know you you have to decide to go this way this route now granted we'll make it worth your while on earth you know we may give you you know a lot of things that your heart desires your mind desires mm -hmm. or you know that you can lord over someone else but um it just, you know, I think those were very key words for me is, you know, assisting and seducing, you know, and, and it's the same that today, you know, we can be seduced into doing all kind of wrong. We can have, you know, people put drugs in front of you and they're like, oh, we're not going to tell you to do it. It's just here. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not going <laughs> to, we're not going to make you do it. We're just going to assist in the process. You know, we're not going to, we're not going to teach you how to steal money. We're just going to show you all the ways that you could, if you, if you ever so wanted to, you know, and I, right. I think so much of that really does play into the fact that it's our choice, our life, our free will um, to go down those, those paths. So yep. I think those were two key words for me, for sure. And let's face it. If, if the wickedness wasn't already in these men's heart, Mastema wouldn't have a chance anyway, or have less of an effect, I believe. So if the wickedness wasn't already there, all he's doing is feeding what's already in their hearts to begin with. Right. Well, last thing I wanted to pull up is uh, in verse six, we have, um, for this reason, he called the name of Sero, Sarug, for everyone turned to do all manner of sin and transgression. So I was like, hmm, what is that? Let's, let's look into that a little bit. So I got a couple of things pulled up here. And the first thing I've got is um, it's meaning branch. And this is for Sarug, branch et uh, etymology from the noun <laughs> Sarig branch or tendril from the verb sarag to be intertwined which i thought was interesting intertwined mixed in is kind of another thing for intertwined but twined also references kind of a twisting right which goes back to the word wick or wicked right that's where we get that word from so that's that's kind of where my thoughts going on, on that and then to dig in a little bit deeper, I found this. It says, um, Genesis eleven twenty 20, uh, names him as the son of Reu. He was the father of the first Nahor, of Ram's grandfather. Um, there is obviously a connection between the name Reuben, which is uh, Reuven, and even Genesis gives the etymology with this connection. The city of uh, Sarugi lies between uh, Haran and Carchemish, uh, uh, in what is in what is today Turkey, but in biblical times was Asher, Syria, and is almost certainly the town intended here. We should read Sarug then as a uh, sedentary tribe rather than as a single individual. The name means shoot, as in the process of bifurcation. We would say offspring or progeny. This could well indicate that Sarug was not actually his name, but a description of his relationship given in the absence of knowing his name. The name of Sarug has also been identified with Sarak, who belongs to the name uh, to the same branch of the same 
family. By the way, it does say the book of Jubilees chapter 1. I think that was a little typo there, and that's supposed to be chapter 11, because obviously that's where we read it. Yeah. <laughs> so pretty cool, huh? Not cool what they were doing, but yeah, cool to kind of <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> All right, let's jump into verse 7. And he says, and he grew up and dwelt in Ur of the Chaldees near to the father of his wife's mother, and he worshiped idols, and he took to himself a wife in the 36th Jubilee in the fifth week. In the first year thereof, and her name was Melka, the daughter of Kabar, the daughter of his father's brother, and she bare him Nahor in the first year of this week, and he grew and dwelt in Ur of Chaldees. And his father taught him in the researches of the Chaldees to divine and augur according to the signs of heaven. And in the 37th Jubilee, in the sixth week, in the first year thereof, he took to himself a wife, and her name was Jaska, the daughter of Nestag, of the Chaldees. And she bare him Terah in the seventh year of this week. And the prince, Mastima, sent ravens and birds to devour the seed which was sown in the land in order to destroy the land and rob the children of men of their labors. Before they could plow in the seed, the ravens picked it from the surface, surface of the ground, and from this and for this reason he called his name Terah, because the ravens and the birds reduced them to destitution and devour their seed. Okay, well, the first thing that I had in this was actually in verse 8, and his fathers taught him the researches of the Chaldees to divine and augur uh, according to the signs of heaven. So clearly this is not a good thing. No, which is what, what led him to be... A idol maker later. Yep. What does that augur word mean? Oh no. Let's look. Yep. Let's do that. Of an event or circumstance, portend a good or bad outcome. The end of the Cold War seemed to augur, augur. Well, ogre. I think that's how you said. So okay. it actually is it's supposed to be augur. I've got one here too, Kyle, to go along with that too. Is the noun part of this? It says, in ancient Rome, a religious official who observed natural signs, especially the behavior of birds. That's interesting because we're going into birds next. Yeah, we're going into birds in this chapter. Mm. It says, uh, especially the behavior of birds, interpreting these as an indication of divine approval or disapproval of a proposed action. Mm. So it's interesting that word behavior of birds is used here. Mm. Yeah. Okay, um, so the next thing is, um, and she bare him to Ra. I thought I'd go ahead and look up that name also. Um, and what I found is uh, Tara is a Hebrew name that means to breathe or spirit. Hmm. In the Bible, Tara is the name of the father of Abraham, who was the founder of the Israelite nation. Tara is also referred to as Telrach, which is which means Ebex or Ibex, wild goat, or wanderer, loiterer. <laughs> he is mentioned in the Hebrew, Old Testament, Bible, and New Testament. Mm. Okay. Hey, Kyle. So mm -hmm. it just hit me. I, I don't know if I'm making a connection that's not there, but like Yom Teruah is Feast of Trumpets. Is that correct? And yep. you just said wind. And ibex, which ibex is one of the horns used with shofars. So I wonder if there's this huge, big connection there. Well, I didn't say wind. I said breath or spirit. Okay. Yeah. Even but better. But still, but still, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I believe the shofar can be representative of that of, of the Holy Spirit, the, the breath, you know, uh, the blowing, if you will, of the, you know, the shofar. Interesting. All right, make a note of that. That's the next shofar kind we have to get. The Ibex wild goat. The Ibex is like the big, long, like that one. Well, let's see. But yeah, Terua from Yom Terua is the only difference is one U. It's T E R U A H. But if you look at his name, it's just T E R A H. So it's literally one letter difference from ter Tara and Terua. And one of them not meaning good, and the other one good. Well, which one, which one's not good? I'm sorry. Terra. I thought it meant breath Tara. or spirit. Also means wild goat. <laughs> huh? 
Nothing wrong with the world. Just because it, it says breath and spirit doesn't mean it's the right spirit. So <laughs> that's true. Well, here is an image of the ibex or wild goat. Mm. Yeah, there that you go. Be the, that would be the horns there. So uh, that's one heck of a shofar right there, ain't it? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. If it curved any more, though, you'd be blasting yourself in the face. <laughs> 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 that's interesting. Maybe we can dig down that a little, little further later on. So this was something uh, I found interesting. And the Prince Mestima sent ravens and birds to devour the seed, which was sown in the land. So Prince Mestima, or Hasatan, the adversary, he had influence over the birds. Mm -hmm. I find that interesting. I find that very interesting because we can go back to uh, Matthew chapter uh, 13 and the parable of the seed sower. Ooh. Yeah, about it. Because uh, oh. in, in verse 4 it says, and he sowed some, and he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. And that's in uh, chapter 13, verse 4. Mm. So I'm seeing a connection here between what the ravens are doing. And we're going to get mm -hmm. into that in, in, in the, the other part of this chapter a little bit more with Abraham, because Abraham's coming into the picture here soon. But we see that, again, there's a correlation between, I believe, Yeshua's parable and what's taking place here with what Hasatan is doing with the birds. Yeah, so something that really cool just popped into my head, um, which that's why I really enjoy reading this and studying along with you guys here on YouTube, is we get to uh, have these real organic thoughts. So we know um, Terah, I mean, if we've read through our scriptures, Terah's end going to end up being the father of Abram and later Abraham. And right. isn't it just like Satan, Mastema, to try to interrupt the plans of God? Right. So we see mm -hmm. him try to stop the birth of Moses. We see him try to stop the birth of uh, Yeshua. And here he's trying to starve the people out and say, hey, if I take all their seed and all their food and I just completely ruin the generation, there's going to be no Abram. There's no future generation right. for this man, Terah. And I was just sitting there kind of like really mulling over that of how Satan's always trying to circumnavigate God's plans, how he's trying to see if I can cut the line off or the genealogy. And, you know, it's, it seems like he, he knows a little bit more than what we would have known if we were living in the earth at the time. Hey, if I can stop this guy from having any future children, all future generations are coming from Abram. He's going to be the one with the covenant and the promise. If I can stop that at this point, I might be successful in my tyrannical you know, desire to rule the world. And, uh, you know, you see that that's played out so many times over and over again. And really, what is it all – lead back to it all leads back to yeshua right you know we're reading the story here about Torah and ravens or whatever somehow or another every verse every scripture leads us back to a, the son of god the savior and i just love that there's that that common thread and tr and theme where if we pull the string eventually we'll get back to jesus you know i know that's a sunday school answer but you know in this scenario it's really true and i just it just was an awesome thought that i've been sitting here on the whole time yeah that's awesome all right guys let's jump into verse 13 it says, and the years began to be barren owing to the birds, and they devoured all the fruit of the trees from the trees. It was only with great effort that they could save a little of all the fruit of the earth in the in their days. And in this 39th jubilee, in the second week in the first year, Terah took to himself a wife, and her name was Edna, the daughter of Abram, the daughter of his father's sister. And in the seventh year of this week, she bare him a son and called his name Abraham, Abraham by the name of the father of his mother, for, the, for he had died before his daughter had conceived a son. So we see that Abram, a.k.a. Abraham, was named after his grandfather, who apparently who had died um, before the child was conceived. So I thought I'd bring up over here the side note over here. If you can see my cursor on the right-hand side of the page, mm -hmm. it says, It was customary to name a child after a grandfather. Uh, here the child's name apparently uh, perpetuates the memory of a grandfather who had died before the child was conceived. So that was a customary thing. Mm -hmm. My family followed the same thing. So guys, I know we kind of left some things open-ended here, but I think we've got some answers coming up in the next part here that we're going to finish up in chapter 11. So we will see you next time right here on Anchor to Truth for part two of chapter 11, the book of Jubilees. God bless. Shalom. Well, there's some people that have a theory that birds aren't real. 
that birds aren't real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've yeah, they're it. all. <laughs> yeah, you ha have you heard of it? I've actually seen somebody with a sign in their yard that says <laughs> birds yeah. aren't real. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the poop on my car would beg to differ. Yeah. The one that my cat left at my front door the other day, I would I would beg to differ. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, they're all um, they're all uh, CIA drones. Birds aren't real. Mm. Yeah, and they recharge by landing on power lines. Does that work for all people? <laughs> I'm just saying that's a thing that some people. <laughs> Look, uh, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but I don't think that's that's a left turn I want to make. So, bro, what do what do you do in Africa where there's no power lines? You know, out in the middle of the oh, those are upgraded. They have, they have they have solar on their wings, so they just you know, ah yeah, so solar feathers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> instead of panels, that's hilarious. <laughs>